Okay, let's get started. The Design Development Review Commission is made up of volunteers with expertise or interest in historic preservation and design. We generally meet on the second Thursday of the month to review cases. Staff to the commission are our urban design and historic preservation staff. They are available to answer questions if you have them, but please do not interrupt proceedings if you do indeed need to speak with one of them. The meeting generally proceeds with the staff calling the case and describing it. I will call for the applicant to come forward afterward to add to the basic description of the request if necessary or if the applicant wishes to do so. If so, the applicant should keep the presentation to 10 minutes or less. The commissioners will then have the opportunity to ask questions. At this point, I will ask if there is anyone in the audience who wishes to speak for or against the proposal. Audience comments shall be kept to two minutes per person. If there is, the applicant will have an opportunity to respond and this rebuttal shall not exceed five minutes. In most cases, we will make a decision tonight after all information has been presented. If your case is denied and if you feel that our decision was made in error, you and anyone withstanding have the opportunity to appeal it within 30 days of the decision. If you plan to speak about a specific project, you must have signed in. The sheet is at the back of the room. Also, and so that members of the public understand, commissioners are under strict instructions to avoid discussing DDRC meetings and applications with members of the public or with each other outside of these proceedings to avoid ex parte communications. So if you wish to speak during the course of these proceedings, please stand and raise your right hand. You affirm to tell the truth in these proceedings. Okay. Uh, could we have the roll, please? Mr. Bocknight? Here. Mr. Daniel? Here. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Here. Mr. Wynn? Here. Mr. Savory? Here. We have a quorum. Great. Uh, does the agenda still stand? There have been a couple of changes since publication. On the historic agenda, case listed as um, number three, which or five, excuse me, 2730 Cypress Street which is a request for certificate of design approval for exterior changes and addition in the old Shandon Lower Waverly Protection Area A has been withdrawn. And case number six, 140 South Walker Street, request for certificate of design approval for demolition in the Shandon Community Character Area has been deferred. Thank you. And moving on to the consent agenda, the DDRC utilizes a consent agenda for those projects which require DDRC review, but which meet the guidelines and typically require no discussion. If anyone wishes to discuss an item on the consent agenda, I will ask that you speak up after the consent agenda is read and we can pull the item for discussion onto the regular agenda. Staff, staff could please uh, read the consent agenda. The first case is 1701 Pendleton Street. This is a request for certificate of design approval for an addition in the University Architectural Conservation District. Case two is 3421 to 3423 North Main Street. This is a request for a certificate of design approval for new construction in the North Main Corridor Overly District. And case number three is 1000 Hampton Street, request for a preliminary certification of the Bailey Bill. This is an individual landmark. And also this will include the approval of the April minutes. Does anyone wish to take an item off the consent agenda for discussion? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda and the meeting minutes? Second? Second. Have a vote, please. Mr. Bocknight? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Yes. Mr. Savory? Yes. Motion passes. And our first case, please. Um, let me please also add for the record that the minutes will be adjusted. Yeah. Added. They, they, mm -hmm. Okay. I asked for that in the motion. Okay. I think. The first case, this is on the um, urban design agenda, is 1041 Marion Street. This is in the City Center Design Development District and it is a request for certificate of design approval for the replacement of storefront. Claire Tower is a 12 story residential tower with first floor retail space designed by Lyles. Lyles, Bissett, Carlisle, and Wolf, completed in 1949. The building is a good example of mid-century modern architecture and retains most of its original features, which represent popular modern building technologies 
the materials of the period. Included in your packet is a brief excerpt about the firm from a research report by Lydia Brandt, South Carolina Architecture Seminar at USC. It reads, based in Columbia, LBC and W was the South's preeminent architecture firm for 30 years following World War II. The firm designed some of the state's and certainly Columbia's most notable buildings in a range of interpretations of modernism. LBC and W was able to transform the built environment of the South into a modernist landscape. Their magnitude and versatility coupled with their atypical organizational structure and breadth of work gave them the competitive edge needed to reshape the skyline of the South time and time again. The application is a request to replace the existing storefront with a bronze-colored framing to match the Marion Street entrance that was replaced previously. Staff was unable to find a permit or a certificate of design approval on file, so it is unclear when the front door and the adjacent storefront and trim were replaced. And then following are the relevant guidelines from Section 5.9 of the City Center Design Development Guidelines. When an existing structure is to be renovated or expanded, care should be taken to complete the work in a manner that respects the original design character of the structure. The appropriate design guidelines in this section are to be implemented whenever a structure is to be renovated or expanded. And under 5.9.3, the third bullet is where the original storefront is completely missing, extensive remodeling has occurred. The first priority is to reconstruct the storefront based on historical, pictorial, and physical documentation. If that is not practical, the design of the new storefront should be compatible with the size, scale, proportion, material, and color of the existing structure. While the thin aluminum framing that is currently in place is consistent with storefronts of this, this time period, it is clear that the existing storefront has most likely been completely replaced. In the historical photographs, there appear to be several storefront entrances on the first level, three on Senate, and at least an additional one on Marion, close to the corner. The concrete sidewalks still lead up to the glass in these locations. Currently, there are fewer storefront doors, and the ones that do exist are framed differently than what is shown in the photos. Since all of the evidence suggests that the storefront is not original, and since it is in very poor condition, the staff recommendation is to allow for replacement with a similar material and pane configuration as the original, from what we know from historical photographs. The applicant's request is to replace the storefront with a wider profile, dark bronze anodized framing, and a narrow, narrower pane configuration than what currently exists. Staff denied this request and that it was found not to meet the guidelines in Section 5.9.3, Storefront Renovation of the City Center Design Development Guidelines. The recommendation to the Commission is for allowable replacement with a thin profile, silver-colored framing with as few seams as possible, aligning the seams with the columns. And I believe the applicant is here to present their case, I think. Could the app applicant come forward if you would like? Guess not. They're not here. Okay. Uh, I think we are then going to move into deliberation on the part of the commissioners. Any comments? One question. It looks like there's just a mishmash of a whole bunch of different things on the front now. Currently. So their proposal is to replace everything that's there except for the bronze existing correct. door that was placed a few years ago that's correct okay would this be on the rear side too or just the, the three sides that are visible i think all the storefront that is um on the building okay. um so yeah and it's almost all visible from the right of way any other comments I, well i would like to say for the record that i i agree with uh, staff's recommendation and uh Although perhaps the building doesn't at first blush seem as if it's a historic building, it very much is. It's over 50 years old. It very much is a uh, uh, absolutely prime example. Uh, 1949, mm -hmm. prime example of a, a mid-century modern building uh, in Columbia that, that uh, is eligible for the National Register without any doubt. Uh, Lyles Bissett Carlina Wolf was uh, to this day still probably the most prominent firm that has ever existed in Columbia, <clears throat> one of the most prominent firms that's ever existed in the Southeast, and this was one of their very, very first projects. So uh, I think uh, it's very important um, that new work that's done on the building uh, should as much as possible emulate the original uh, detailing and materials that were on the building. So I, I completely 
I completely agree with staff's assessment and recommendation. What was the applicant's um, consideration of the recommendation for silver colored framing? My understanding, and I, I haven't actually spoken with the building owner, I believe they live out of state. Um, so the applicant is the glass company that, was, that they were working with in order to replace the storefront. So we've actually had very little communication. I mean, they have the staff evaluation and the recommendations, and they just they submitted their application as an appeal. Basically, um, this would have been a staff level approval if they had, you know, replacing storefront on a building in city center that's not a historic district or a landmark building could have been done at the staff level if it followed the guidelines. But since they wanted to do something that staff found was inconsistent with the guidelines, they basically appealed the staff denial to the commission to try to get that approved. So, I mean, I'm surprised. I thought they were going to be here, but um, I haven't had any correspondence since, you know, we sent them the evaluation, I believe, Friday or Monday. So. Okay. Should Thank we, you. Should we yeah. defer to have... next month or just press on? No. Okay. No. I, they must have Harris's Outlook calendar. <laughs> yep. Uh, so let me ask a question about the uh, about the, the motion that I'm about to ask. You have t really two different things here. One is a recommendation of denial of the request. The other is a recommendation uh, for something that would be allowable. Are we are we able to uh, make a motion based on what would be allowable at this point, so that you can move forward, or how do you? I think so. I, I guess I was hoping that the glass company, being the applicant, was going to be here to answer technical questions about maybe what they could do. Um, I mean, it, technically, they, it, the request was denied by staff, so the application as presented, I mean, yeah, the request is to deny that, but I think it is reasonable to replace the storefront because it isn't original and because it is in poor condition and just would recommend that whatever that is is close, as close as possible to what we can tell. And, and you're comfortable that uh, if we were to make a recommendation uh, for allowable replacement, that uh, that could be, that's narrow enough to be handled by staff? I think so, yes. Okay. Um, is any commissioner uh, interested in making that motion? I'll, I'll be, make it. Uh, I would recommend uh, that we deny the request for the uh, Palmetto State Glasses request for wider profile dark bronze ironized framing on the uh, 1041 Marion Street address as it is not in compliance with the guidelines in section 5.9.3 storefront renovations of the city center design development guidelines. I would also propose or recommend that they be allowed to work with staff uh, for allowable replacement of a thin profile, silver colored framing with as few seams as possible, aligning the seams with the columns. Second? Second. Any discussion? We have a vote, please. Mr. Bachnight? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Filler Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Yes. Mr. Savory? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Next case. The next case is 1111 Bull Street, and this is a request for certificate of design approval for new signage. This also is an appeal to a staff decision in the City Center Design Development District. So this case is the WIS uh, TV studio building, and for new signage, or it's replacement signage, currently there are two signs on each side or each street facing elevation, one each for WIS News 10 and one for Raycom Media. All four signs are routed aluminum wall signs with halo illumination, consistent with the city center design development guidelines.
Yeah, thank you for a couple of uh, approvals for uh, the landmark storm this evening in May. We're good? Okay. Recess is over. Let's uh, come out of recess. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, currently, the, um, there are four signs on the building. They're routed aluminum wall signs with halo illumination consistent with the city center design development guidelines, which were permitted in 2015. The new signs are the same size and in the same location. The changes include Raycom Media's new logo, as well as the proposed change that all four signs will be internally illuminated, acrylic-based channel letters. Staff found the proposal to be inconsistent with the design guidelines and denied the request. This is an appeal to the staff decision. Below are the relevant sign design guidelines for City Center. The following materials are recommended for signs in City Center. Uh, metal, etched, formed, etched, cast, engraved, and properly primed and painted or factory coated. Custom neon tubing in the form of graphics or lettering may be incorporated into several of the above permitted sign types. Individually mounted, internally illuminated channel letters and internally illuminated plastic-based cabinet signs are discouraged. Internally illuminated channel letters and other plastic or acrylic materials for signs are not allowed in city center. The only exceptions are when the skyline provisions are triggered. This is a sign at the top of a multi-story building, more than five stories tall. And then illumination. Uh, if the sign can be illuminated by an indirect source of light, this is usually the best arrangement because the sign will appear to be better integrated with the building's architecture. Light fixtures supported in front of the structure cast light on the sign and generally a portion of the face of the structure as well. Indirect lighting emphasizes the continuity of the structure surface and signs become an integral part of the facade. Backlighted solid letters are a preferred alternative to internally illuminated letter signs. Signs comprised of opaque individually cut letters mounted directly on a structure can often use a distinctive element of the structure's facade as a backdrop, thereby providing a better integration of the sign with the structure. The internally illuminated channel letters are inconsistent with the design guidelines. Alternatives to illumination could be indirect lighting, halo illumination, similar to what is existing, or exposed neon tubing. And then 6.3 6 wall signs. Signs should be located where architectural features or details suggest a location, size, or shape for the sign. The best location for a wall sign continues to be a band or blank area between the first and second floors of a building. This building does not lend itself to wall signs as it is a style that is not typical of urban commercial businesses. While acknowledging this fact, staff has consistently approved signs in the current locations as there are not any other areas that are suited for signage, and it is the area between the first and second floors as recommended by the guidelines. Staff recommends approval of the request for certificate of design approval for all four signs conditional upon revising the method of illumination to reflect the recommendations of the city center design development guidelines. And the applicant um, is Hugh Jacobs and is here to present their Case. Hey, your name for the in the microphone, please. Hugh Jacobs, design director at WIS TV. I'm with Lyle Schultze, the general manager at WIS TV. Um, three years ago, when Lyle came to WIS, he realized we didn't have any logos on our building. It had not had them there for 62 years. Um, I had myself had always wondered why we didn't have any more than just the letters WIS television on the wall to uh, designate our location. We're often having to call people up and when they were coming to visit us, I'd have to give them specific directions and tell them the building with the columns in front. So having the logos on our building to let people know who we were and where we were, we felt was a very great addition to, to um, our building. We applied then to have internally illuminated letters for our signs. Uh, we used a, a company named Signorama out of Orangeburg. They did the presentation to y'all. We were turned down and we decided to do the, as y'all suggested, the backlit let channel letters. Um, the problem with that, especially at night, is we have a big tin in our logo, which is a large box to, to merely have it is backlit, it would, we were afraid at night it would just look like a big box that was backlit. You wouldn't be able to see the tin, which is our main part of our logo. Um, so we, we went ahead with the backlit and it just didn't 
pop out. Off, of course, it's off the brick. And so we had a warm color off of the letters on our logos. Whereas we, were, we did get the push through acrylic for the tin approved. However, that is kind of a bluish cool white, whereas the rest of the white was a warm color. And there's a dichotomy between the two colors. It just looks, they look different, like they're two different signs. So Raycom changed the logo in December. We knew we had to get a new sign put up. Um, their logo and we're, uh, is white and yellow, and as you can see, the um, letters are very narrow. So when we decided, when we realized we had to put up a new Raycom lo uh, logo, we decided we probably should see if we could get internally illuminated letters um, to hopefully to, to make our logo show up better in the evening, especially the, the Raycom logo. Um, when we had that problem the first time, when we were not happy with the backlit letters, we um, were told that we could put a, a acrylic or metal backing on the two logos to get a little more reflection off of the backlighting. The problem was that was then we would have these huge dark black or, bur or brick colored um, plaques behind our logos, which we felt took away from our building during the daytime because you it would be covering up most of the brick between the two windows on both sides. So we ruled against that. We were told we could build lights off of the top of our building, but when we went in and photoshopped and looked at what the lights hanging up, you know, pulling down off of the top of the building, we weren't real happy with how that would look from the, from the street. So we're just, when we decided to do this, we, we decided to look at the, um, your um, regulations, and we, we did see that, and, and talked to several people also, that although, um, you discourage internally illuminated letters. Um, it's not, we couldn't find that it was actually not, completely not allowed. Um, we don't feel like the internally lit letters would be, we actually think they would look better than what we have up there at night, at night now. We don't think it's out of keeping with the character of um, downtown Columbia. It's not, we don't think it's garish or gaudy. We think it would actually uh, look nice and more elegant than what we have now. So we're just asking to be allowed to use the internally illuminated letters if possible. Thank you. Is there anybody here who would like to speak in support or opposition to the applicant's proposal? Okay. Uh, comments from the commissioners, please. Yeah, staff, can you put back the present? There's a picture here that shows what's proposed. Do we have one that shows? I ride by it all the time, but I don't remember. You don't. You don't have one at night that shows existing, do you? No, there's not a. There's not one that shows the current nighttime illumination. Um, I took pictures at night. They didn't look any, the photos, no matter what I, how I took them or the lighting I used, I couldn't get them to actually replicate what they look like at night, so I did not include them okay. Okay. in this. And I guess the question for staff that he's raised is, the, in 6.2.2, it does say individually mounted, internally illuminated channel letters and internally illuminated plastic face cabinet signs are discouraged. Uh, further comments, it stated that these are not allowed in city center. So I, I, I think one or the other is wrong. They don't seem to. Well, I, I guess I'll just chalk it up to, I mean, these guidelines were written 20 years ago. And I think that most of staff would agree that the word discouraged is really unfortunate because it's not clear. And in order for us to be clear, making decisions at the staff level, we don't allow for them. So we have never written staff level approvals for internally illuminated channel letters um, since, since the district was in, put in place that I'm aware of. So if that's you, kind of, that's just, again, a consistent. If you look at the strict interpretation of what we actually have to follow, then it, all it says is discouraged. Right. 
So, I mean, I guess the argument would be, like, like, like the evaluation says, the only exceptions have been at the top of a multi-story building where you literally couldn't see any other type of illumination. So those are where exceptions are made. Um, I mean, I guess discouraged is a word that, I mean, you have to do something with that. So we, we discourage it. We don't, we don't permit them at the staff level, which is why the board is here to make those kinds of exceptions if you feel that this warrants an exception. Well, I, I know that, I mean, from being involved when the guidelines were being written 20 years ago, uh, that there is always the, the sort of um, trend to go to uh, should language rather than shall language. Uh, you know, for obvious reasons, the guidelines are always uh, a matter of interpretation. That's why, you know, we're sitting here. So I think discourage. To me, the meaning of the word is clear. It's not uh, shall not, but it's discouraged. And I, I think the other question for the commission is the question of precedent. Um, you know, I think it's, you can talk about the effect of what this would, um, the, the effect that this would have uh, on this building in this particular case. Um, but as, as uh, Lucinda mentioned, uh, it's a matter of looking back at previous precedent, but also looking forward at uh, future, the future if we you know, continue to set a precedent and what kind of precedent um, we feel is appropriate as a commission. So I think that's, that's an important consideration. Other comments or questions? Not sure. When I was looking through the reasons that it was discouraged, the main reason that I could find was that it might have too much illumination on nearby residences, um, which I can understand, but we don't have anybody <laughs> living on either side of the street from WIS. So that was the only definite reason or for discouragement of having internally illuminated letter, letters that I could find in the laws, rulings that, uh, that I found online. Right. So. Thanks. Thanks. Any other comments? I have a couple questions. Are the, we're talking about all four signs? Yes. Is the, the WIS News 10 sign, is that essentially the same? The sign looks the same, I mean, during the day. It's just the type of illumination is different. So the, the actual graphics and the logo have not changed on that one, but it is currently halo illuminated, and so this would be more like a, you know, internally illuminated face. Thank you. And then the, is the current Raycom sign, is that, are those channel letters on a raceway or just channel letters individually attached to the building? I believe you know? those are individually mounted. I'm not sure. Yeah. The, okay. Also halo, the current ones. Okay. And then just, just so I'm clear, I think, we're talking about whether they're reverse lit or face lit? The, the proposal, right. The proposal is for everything to be face, the face to be illuminated, channel letters, yeah. Okay. Acrylic faces, they're all lit up. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you like to make a motion, Mr. Cohen? Um, I'm thinking, I don't have the full section. The, um, it's on the, it should be on the handout that if that's what you need. Yes, yes sir. sir. Were you sworn in? Sorry? Were you sworn in? No, I was not. Did you sign in? We didn't know that you signed in. Ah, uh, well, do you, do you swear to tell the truth in the proceedings? I, I should okay. I do. And state your name, please. Lyle Schulze, general manager of WIS. I just wanted to make the point that what we're doing here is not any different than what's up there right now, largely. I mean, the significance of the change will be minimal. Um, our, our logo is our representative of our business, not our building. So it's significant that we have our logo on the building. The other significance to this is our company changed its logo, which hadn't been changed in 25 years. So. It was the motivation behind it. Um, and that's all I wanted to say, that there will be no notable to anybody who
crosses paths with Bull Street and Gervais every day change to what we're doing other than this Raycom logo really changing? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I do have another question. Okay. Please. If, if we are, in fact, making a substitution that I would tend to feel is an improvement, is there precedent for well, the, allowing what, one and the same to proceed? What staff has said is that there's not, that it hasn't been allowed before. Okay. Correct? Is that right? Correct. That's, I'm not aware of any exceptions that have been made for this particular one. Um, again, except for the skyline provisions, which those have been done at the staff level. So I think, I mean, the, the recommendation from staff would be, uh, particularly with the Raycom, I think the, the nighttime picture, I think that type of illumination could be achieved with an exposed um, type of neon tubing, which is in line with the guidelines as opposed to having an acrylic base. And, you know, the concern, of course, is, like you said, making an exception. If it's made, that's the, up to the commission, but I think the condition, or the reason for that should be clear so that we're not just opening the door for every business who wants one, you know, to have one. I actually did, I have another question. Um, is how much, how much yard do you have uh, from the face of the building to the uh, sidewalk? About five feet? Okay. But it could be done. But you could, I mean, it could be done. It could be done. Okay. I just want to clarify that. Any more comments before we move to a motion? Are you ready? Do you want to? Put me in the hot seat. <laughs> Somebody else? Happy to take a craft at one if go to uh, I make the motion that we could, um, I'm sorry if you want to you can just if it fits you can read the staff recommendation and amend that in any way you care to okay I'll make the motion that we approve the applicants request for a certificate of design approval for the new signs at 1 uh, 1111 and on 1111 Bull Street and 1416 Gervais Street um, I would make the motion that we approve them as submitted um, based on the particular exception that to me they look appear to be presented almost distinctly the same except for the change of the Raycom sign. I don't really know how to <laughs> craft this. Uh. Well, what, what am I uh, think about this for a minute if I need to clarify? I'll second that motion. Any discussion? I, well, I, I think that there's, I think that there, whether or not it's an acceptable difference, there's a significant difference in the fact that the, that the signs glow. Um, so I, I don't think it's, I, I think we should characterize it as being no difference. I think during the day it's not going to be much different, but I think the evening shots that we see here are, they're clearly different. So I, I think that we need to uh, acknowledge that. I wish I had an image of what it looks like now at night. I can't compare. Well, we're in the middle of deliberation before we vote so we have a second on the motion so I guess it's a up or down on that and if it doesn't pass then we have a new motion exactly, exactly right so and if there are other comments we need to take a vote Mr. Bach Knight no Mr. Cohn yes Mr. Daniel yes Ms. Fuller Wilt no Mr. Wynn yes Mr. Savory no Well, we have a tie. We have a tie. Okay. We need another motion. Um, can I have one? I'll make a motion. You want mine? Anyone will do. 
Uh, I, I would make a motion that we uh, approve the request for certificate of design approval for all four signs conditional upon revising the method of illumination to reflect the recommendations of the uh, city center design development guidelines. Any discussion on this one? A way to clarify. Well, there are several different ways to light the signs. Uh, the applicant uh, has, there are some ways that the, uh, the applicant doesn't want, you know, would prefer not to do it. But uh, the, uh, the motion leaves open for further discussion with staff as to how to create a, a lighting effect. So uh, that could be um, within the guidelines, and staff, correct me if I'm wrong, but that could be lighting either they, they discuss from the roof they don't prefer that it could be lighting from the ground it could be backlighting similar to what they have now so there the the motion is uh, to allow staff to work with the applicant on arriving at a solution that still offers illumination of the sign but not this not what they're proposing if i if i may add also um i would recommend staff to consider the um, conditional method of illumination to consider that the there is that five foot distance from the street side to the building side uh, to where these signs would be illuminated this is not like being in the heart of the vista up against the pedestrian right-of-way etc um, I think that should be taken into consideration as well when one might make a choice. I think my concern too is that the neon signs have tended to be brighter than the LED if that's, we have installed those in the past in my experience. The brightness is, for the board, if illumination and the intensity of it is an issue, I think what's on here potentially is something that's actually working against what the concern is. I think, I mean, my understanding of it, there, there are different concerns. The you know, um, acrylic cabinet signs, you know, that's, I think the, the, the issue comes in when you, again, set a precedent and we start to get multiple things along a streetscape and it's just, you know, you have more glowing boxes and more glowing letters and it just, so it's not necessarily just brightness. I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, the, the guidelines specifically say neon is allowed. It's just a material that's allowed, so we just we allow those. It may be a little bit brighter, but it's not the same as like an. And they also talk a lot about the facing, you know, plastic facing. It's a materials and an illuminations issue. Um, there's other types of illumination that wouldn't include a plastic or acrylic type face. So we're sort of dealing in some ways with two, I guess, violations of the guidelines. Mm -hmm. So it's sure. it's the internally illuminated part, but it's also the plastic facing part. So exposed neon would provide, I think. A brighter answer but it wouldn't it would be in line with the guidelines I, again I think that I, in my mind I'm most concerned about precedent about future um, implications on future signage well anyway any other comments before we move to a vote okay let's try this one mr. Bach Knight yes mr. Cohn no Mr. Daniel? No. Ms. Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? No. Mr. Savory? Yes. And we have okay. another tie. Another so tie. Another well, somebody else has another yes. idea. We need another motion. Or further discussion before we make a motion. I think we, we've got two camps here, one that, it, it, I don't know how we meet in the middle other than send it back to staff to continue to work with the applicant. Which is what the last motion was. No, but. That's why we're here. With an even number of people. Yeah. Does somebody have another motion or another thought? Well, again. would like to see an actual representation of so I could compare something so if it goes 
back to traffic because as the last motion said, then I, I guess I wouldn't be reviewing it then, but that's another potential that we come back next month with the actual images of what it would look like in the different variations so that we actually know what we're voting on. Um, and I do think that the precedent setting aspect of just straight up approving this without staff recommendation um, is something I'm concerned with as well. Following up on her comments, I mean, if we could have something that maybe shows what it looks like now, I mean, I ride by it all the time, but quite frankly, you know, it's just a sign I haven't really spotlighted on. Maybe, I mean, they provided what they think it's going to look like, right? Uh, maybe we have an example of what it looks like now, uh, although that's still a, not the kind of sign they want to put up in the future. I mean, we can certainly, if that's, I mean, if the commission decides to defer this to get that information, we can certainly provide that. I think, I think that doesn't really change. I mean, the proposal no, right. is to do this, right. which is an exception to the guidelines. So, um, I mean, certainly it would be a comparison of what's there now, although I would still say that there are other ways to eliminate the sign, not just what's currently there and not just what's being proposed, but there are other options certainly. that could certainly provide well, more maybe illumination. That, well, maybe that's where we need to be is what other alternatives are there well, I guess the, there's two that we've already discussed. Right. One of them is um, external illumination, so some type of spotlight, and I've, those could be done multiple ways, on up the, on the top of the building, on the grass, on the ground. It could even be there's like little, almost like the ones you see on a piece of art that actually shine down on the the logo. There is exposed neon. There's all kinds of technology that I probably don't even know about with sign companies. I mean, there's lots of, of different options out there probably stuff that's not specifically addressed by our guidelines that are 20 years old, but um, certain things, you know, pretty, I mean, I think there's newer versions of exposed neon that may not, that may be more technologically advanced that have that same look. I think, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, looking at these images, I, I mean, I don't, I don't find them offensive, although they are, brighter than what's there now, and that certainly will be the case at night. Uh, in terms of wayfinding, uh, we all drive by Google these days, so I, you know, I think that there's, the signage is, is already there. But I think, aside from that, in my mind, what I envision is, uh, if we approve this, then another applicant will come with signs that are eight feet by 10 feet that are fully lit and bright. And uh, we don't have information, we typically don't get information about uh, you know, the foot candles of a sign. Uh, this, I think potentially, I don't think, it would potentially open the door to uh, a next applicant or the one after that uh, asking for something that's much, much more um, uh, intrusive than, than this signage. So my understanding from what staff has said is that uh, to their knowledge, uh, this kind of technology, this kind of sign has not been so far approved. If we approve it, then I think we need to assume that we or future you know, commissions will um, have to approve it again. So I. You know, that's my, my, my concern is really based on precedent and future implications. And I guess my concern is the guidelines say are discouraged. Granted, they're old, but that's what's in writing. If there's a problem with that, it needs to be updated to reflect present day terminology. So. No, that's true too. But that's, I, that's my concern I still too. still have to make a judgment. I well, think if it was 20 years ago too, one of the concerns used to be that most of those signs were lit fluorescently or with neon tubes that used to go out. And I think the technology's kind of surpassed the potential of this, this guideline, but I well, think... In, there's also, there, there is the materials issue. I mean, these internally illuminated signs do have acrylic faces and that is also that's even more clear in the guidelines that that's something that, you know, is not, I forget the language, but I mean, I guess I would argue if discouraged is not the same language as 
not allowed, but at the same time, I feel like if it's discouraged, then there should be a real reason why the commission would approve something that's discouraged. I mean, aside from just this is what the applicant is asking for. I think we'd have, I think for it not to be a precedent for future uh, cases, we'd have to um, exactly explain why this, why this particular application gets an exception. And I, I, I don't see a, a particular reason that it would get an exception that then wouldn't apply to future applications. My last uh, point would just be, I think in this particular instance, we're almost substituting equal signs, equal size signs that appear to be the same. Besides, you're right about that. It's, it's not right. like they're coming for something significantly different or that is arguably less attractive than what's there now. I, well, I don't think it's the size that's the issue or even the graphics because I think you're absolutely right about that. It's the fact that it will, you know, completely glow from inside. I mean, I think the end, it's the, you know, the acrylic material. It's just something that it's, it's, is in the original language of the guidelines that is discouraged. And, I, and I'm not saying that, you know, that I'm not making a, a value judgment on the guidelines themselves. I'm just saying that it has been discouraged. Uh, in the past, this type of uh, signage hasn't been, hasn't been approved. If we think that uh, it's time to change that, that's another statement. Or, you know, if we think that there's an exception, whereas this can be, uh, you know, we can, we can approve this, but it's not going to apply to maybe future applications that seem to be garish <clears throat> and seem to be outside of the spirit of the guidelines, then we can state that that exception exists in this particular case, but I don't know what the exception would be. Let me, these may be entirely different situations, but St. Peter's has a sign at the corner of their church across from the library that is more of a sign to show what events are going on at that facility. How is that one lit in relation to how this one is lit? I believe that's a, like a message board, an yes. LED message board. Yes. Um, and those have been allowed on occasion, but that is not an, it's not an internally illuminated you know, acrylic face sign. I mean, message boards have been allowed. Um, again, that was something that wasn't specifically addressed in the guidelines, but they do have a dark background and individual, you know, like LED lights, like, I mean, it's just a different type of sign. It's a different material. It's a different type of illumination. And I think, too, I guess. If I'm not mistaken, and please correct me or, or refresh my memory, we recently had a bank located in the city center mm -hmm. that was internally illuminated, did we not? You had a, a, request, a request to appeal a staff one. decision, and that request was for two things. It was for the size. It was the height of the freestanding sign. Right, it, it was, was street also level. Materials and internal illumination. The request for the internal illumination was not granted. Okay. They are doing an aluminum sign, and um, there was there, the the height was brought down. I don't remember off the top of my head what the height was. Um, I guess again, just as a thinking about exceptions and what those might be, typically have to do with context, some type of context that's different that doesn't apply to other properties. You know, this is a, they have, it's a corner property. It has two major street frontages, and the sign is between the first and second floor, which is generally where signage is recommended to be. So I guess thinking about future signs, this is a very common placement for signs in a very visible location. If it were a business that were maybe, you know, at the back of some parking lot where they're just, you know, you literally couldn't see it, that to me feels like a sort of reasonable, unique situation where they're, you know, so I guess that concerns me because it's, this is a very visible corner with a very prominent location and, and a very typical placement for signage. So let's go back to that one. That's the NBSC at Pendleton and Sumter. And that is, uh, is not an internally, uh, maybe it's not, internally, it's aluminum cabinet with push-through letters, which are allowed. So, and that's that's always been allowed. Aluminum it, facing. It is at a major corner, uh, similar to this location. Right. I, I'm, I'll make a, a suggested motion, and let's let's just see what happens. Uh, 
I'll, I'll make, am I being heard? I'll, I'll make the motion to uh, support staff's recommendation of approval of a request for certificate of design approval for all four signs conditional upon revising the method of illumination to reflect the recommendations of the city center design development guidelines. Pertinent to section 6.2.2. Is there a second? I, we can't now, sorry. I will, I will second. Any further discussion? Let me, let me add that on to that. Uh, in keeping with the recent decision in the NBSC new sign at the corner of Sumter and Pendleton Street, in which uh, internally illuminated letter signs were not approved. Okay. Second. Second. Second the amendment. Any further discussion before we vote? Have a vote. Mr. Bachnight. Yes. Mr. Cohn. No. Mr. Daniel. Yes. Ms. Fuller Wilt. Yes. Mr. Wynn. Yes. Mr. Savory. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, staff can review it with you, and I, I think they're very clear on it. And. Make sure I don't want to make a mistake. Thank you. Next case, please. So this is 1633-1635 Main Street. It's a request for recommendation for landmark status. Um, as a request for landmark status, the commission is asked to make a recommendation for approval or denial to city council, as city council will have the final decision on whether or not this building becomes a landmark. Um, this particular building was constructed in 1873 by John C. Seegers as a saloon. Uh, staff has found that this particular building meets Group 3 landmark status for Criteria 1 and 5. Criteria 1 states the site of events or homes of men, etc., that are interesting locally. Um, this building was owned by Seegers and his partner and son-in-law. Uh, Seegers was a prominent businessman locally um, in the 1800s. He owned property on Main Street that was destroyed in the fire in 1865. Um, so building this building was part of the reconstruction of Main Street after that fire. Uh, Seegers was uh, prominent in several businesses. He, um, he owned ice factories, bottling plants, breweries, and saloons, so specifically in the liquor manufacturing business, um, which was popular, especially along the 1600 block of Main Street. And so this particular building was a saloon, uh, operated as a saloon until the liquor laws changed in 1892, which <laughs> prohibited all but the government from selling and manufacturing liquor. Um, but even after that, uh, Seegers uh, remained a, a prominent and prosperous Colombian uh, through his other business ventures. Um, so staff has found that um, as a building that has connections with prominent businessmen and is part of the reconstruction of Main Street and meets this criteria. Um, this building is also one of two buildings that remain as part of um, the Seegers family enterprises. They built several buildings all throughout Columbia with, with their businesses, and only this building and the building next door remain um, as part of that today. Um, it also meets criteria five. Criteria five states that it's evidencing, evidencing one or more criteria of group two, but two decrepit or destructively modified to constitute a prime historic document. Um, the building was recently renovated to uh, go back to its original appearance, which you can see in the image here, but through several renovations throughout the years, uh, it was drastically altered, as you can see in the photograph, and a lot of the original historic material was lost. So the facade you see today um, is a reconstruction, which is why it's not considered a, a prime historic document, um, but it does meet the criteria for five. 
So staff um, finds that it meets criteria one and five of the city ordinance and uh, for group three landmark designation and recommends, uh, recommends a recommendation of approval. Yeah, applicant like to speak? No? Okay. I mean, I'm a frequent flyer. <laughs> Y'all know as much about my family as I do. I, I think this is a, I think this is a wonderful thing to do. Our, uh, you may know that uh, our building on Washington Street <clears throat> that my uh, partners and I bought so years ago, the number ten over ten years ago, um, is the first the first modern facade to have been protected. And when uh, I came before the DDRC, uh, I was asked by one of the commissioners, uh, are you sure you want to do that? And I said, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I applaud. And, and uh, congratulations, by the way, on your Historic Columbia Award for it. I, I applaud the, uh, you know, the, the gesture. Thank you. We need to quick, quick, on to quick the question. fabric that we have. Do we know when the, the top part of the facade was removed or yeah I, I, um, I don't know when it was removed but we attempted to duplicate it exactly as it um, in these pictures and I don't know what the picture yeah. is on the left um, but this one was um, 1880 and it was there then but when That's the 70s the 70s I I don't know I wish I did um, she, she, I, I don't, he also was in the legislature for five years and head of the penitentiary system that, he, he did a lot of stuff. And for the record, uh, state your name so we have that. Oh, I'm Martha Fowler. Thank you. His great, great granddaughter. Thank you. Make a motion uh, for Approval for landmark status 1633 1635 Main Street as a pending individual landmark. Or as an individual landmark. Is there a second? Second. Any, any discussion? Have a vote, please. <clears throat> Mr. Bachknight? Yes. Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Fuller, -Wil Fuller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Mr. Savory. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. The final case is 1637 Main Street. Uh, this is a request for recommendation for landmark designation, Group 3. Section 17691D, Group 3, consists of structures or sites which round out and extend the material visual history of Columbia when added to Groups 1 and 2. They evidence one or more of the following criteria for selection. 1637 Main Street. is part of a century of economic expansion and architectural development in the state's capital. This is the site of one of Columbia's early grocery stores. Solomon N. Hendricks Grocer is listed at this location in the 1899 city directories. This building, built circa 1867, has continuously contributed to the economic commerce of Columbia over the years through local businesses. 1637 Main Street is also architecturally significant as a contributing structure in a collection of the work of important local architect James B. Er Erhart. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, this structure is part of the Art Modern Collective or genre of buildings of architecture in the Columbia Commercial Historic District. The remaining architecture, including this building, represent Columbia's renewal after the Civil War and the growth of the city from 1865 to 1963 as a period of historical significance. 
Staff finds that the building meets criteria one. The site of events, homes of men, etc., that are interesting locally. And criteria three, belonging to a family or genre of buildings recognized locally. Staff finds that the building meets these criteria for landmark status as outlined in section 17-691D, group three of the city ordinance, and suggests a recommendation for landmark designation. Does the applicant wish to speak? The only thing that I the microphone, please. The and state your name again. State your name again, Again, please. I'm Martha Fowler. Thank you. Okay. John Seegers didn't build it. <laughs> um, but the one thing that I wanted to tell y'all, because I know y'all like little, little cute, fun things, when we got down in the building after we bought it and John Shearer went with us and we decided it didn't have a termite contract, it didn't have anything on it, you know, so we were exploring what was down there. We went down and I, I, I noticed a difference in the coloration of the basement, which is just a dugout like passageway. When you walk into it, I said, what's the difference with this? And he said, Martha, do you know what that is? And I said, I'm asking you. And he said, that's the burn line from when the whole town burned. And you walk through this basement that's dug out dirt, and you see the whole line of where the town burned and dissolved into a foot of different color material. So if you're ever in the dry cleaner, ask Mike to show you, because I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you. Any comments? I just had a question. Um, the criteria one, I don't know if it's criteria, but um, I think that's what you called it, said it was re related to a famous, a well-known person. Uh, the site of events, homes of men, et cetera, that are interestingly local. And so in this case, the event would be the, it, it's, the commerce, the, the, the commerce, relationship? Yes, yeah. the local business okay. that was continuously evolving. Any other questions or comments? Someone would like to make a motion? Make, a mo make the motion that we approve for landmark status as a uh, Group 3 landmark designation. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or deliberation? Do we have a vote, please? Mr. Rockknight? Yes. Mr. Cohn? Yes. Mr. Daniel? Yes. Ms. Spiller Wilt? Yes. Mr. Wynn? Yes. Mr. Savory? Yes. Motion passes. Great. Any further business? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those opposed? <laughs> It's unanimous. Okay.